Okay, uh, well, let's start. So today's topic is uh, an intro to Fourier series and complex numbers. Complex numbers we will need as a tool for Fourier series. Now, uh, why I want to talk about this is that it's, first of all, it's incredibly important for applications and for so many different things. You'll probably see it in other classes, especially if you continue doing math classes. So uh, I want to touch upon this topic and do some simple things that we can do with the tools that we have done so far. So we've ha had a lot of theorems. For example, we had a uh, Weierstrass theorem about density of polynomials and trigonometric polynomials and also neural networks. Uh, we defined product metrics. We defined distances. The last few weeks, we've talked a lot about convergence of series of different type and uh, what, how can you exchange integrals with limits uh, and derivatives, uh, et cetera. This was kind of exactly what you were discussing uh, in the last homework. So how we will do is we'll bring all these tools that we know and we'll recall, especially the Weierstrass one, and we will apply them to this area of Fourier series. But to do that, well, we need to introduce some things first. So, uh, but this will be fairly self-contained uh, and I'll try to simplify things even at the expense of us not, talk, not talking about everything. So the outline of this is that, well, first I wanna tell you what, what is a four-year series, what's the motivation and what are the main issues? And the issues should be familiar to us because they revolve around convergence. Uh, then I will define the complex numbers and don't worry, we don't need them a lot. We need them for some tools, uh, some calculations. Uh, but if you are ever gonna take 132, this can also be useful for you. And you've seen complex numbers a little bit in high school and before, so this is probably not gonna be very difficult. Um, and then we'll start talking about, if there's time, we'll start talking about the tools that uh, are used for Fourier series. And most of those will be probably finished with uh, Friday videos. And uh, the main theorem I will finish on Monday in the Monday lecture. Okay, so uh, an introduction to Fourier series. Uh, let's start with a physical problem. Uh, that this is the original historical motivation, a slight, slightly simplified for our case. So we don't have to talk about all the issues that come up. So you have a rod and the different parts of the rod are at different temperatures. So here the more red colors are warmer. Uh, so, well, it's not completely clear what is warmer, but purple is say warmer than yellow and blue is colder. And uh, this could be the distribution of the temperature at a given time. You heat this rod in a certain way. And uh, suppose this rod is very thin, so you can really model the, the temperature is roughly constant on any cross section of this rod. So, well, we wanna model what happens to this temperature as time evolves uh, and uh, get an equation and study the mathematics related to that. So to do that, well, we take a position on this rod and it being circular, it allows us to use a parameter, a one dimensional parameter theta to parameterize it. So the angle theta, and this theta here will be in the interval zero to two pi. We can, we allow it to also be in a real number with the understanding that you just might wind multiply around the same circle. So theta corresponds to the point sine theta cosine theta. Now the heat content can be modeled by a function that takes in the position theta and outputs a real number. Uh, depending on your scale of heat, that I mean, usually it would be a non-negative real number, but we don't really need that for our analysis. We can allow a general real number. Uh, and um, so let's 
we, we need to fix a little bit some that make some assumptions to make this a bit more concrete so it will be useful to for us we don't want to work in this bounded interval zero to two pi uh, but we want to extend consider the function as defined on all of the real numbers with the understanding of this winding so at four pi you'd still be at the origin or the x-axis uh, and uh, so what this means is that well we have f is a function from r to r uh, we usually assume in the bare minimum that f is continuous our main theorems will actually be for a lot more regular f namely twice differentiable f but for for this f to correspond to the problem that we have we insist that it's two pi periodic meaning that if you add two pi to any value you still get the same function value so in this way f only depends on its values on zero, zero to 2 pi. And feel free to interrupt me at any point in time with questions. So we have, we're looking at continuous periodic two functions uh, on the real line, which correspond to functions on the circle with this identification of theta with sine theta, cosine theta. And the question is, what happens as time evolves? This was studied most famously by uh, Jean-Baptiste uh, Joseph Fourier. And uh, there are a number of questions that you could analyze about it. But the main, main things that he used, there were three things, three behaviors that he used to derive an equation and to analyze its uh, behavior. One thing is about uh, energy. The heat energy is preserved, or heat content is preserved, should be preserved. So there are some conserved quantities in this system. Uh, motivated, partly related to that, uh, he derived a so-called Fourier's law of heat transfer, which tells, uh, roughly speaking, that if you have some surface, and some heat content along this rod, then the amount of tr heat being transferred here is proportional to the derivative. So heat transfer is proportional to the derivative of the function, the change in the heat. The steeper the change, the bigger the heat difference, the more transfer there is. And a third thing that comes up, uh, this probably did not play a huge role in four years development, but it gives us an intuition about what is happening, is that as time goes up to infinity, we expect the heat content to uh, reach Euclid, Euclid, geez, Euclid, Euclid, oh God, uh, I can't somehow say that word, uh, to be constant on the whole circle. So uh, because if there were any heat changes left, then uh, the heat transfer would continue from hot to cold until you would reach the constant state. And I want to do a small uh, simulation about this. So this is stolen from some website. So here, what you're seeing is at time zero, the heat content. And the, you can think of this as being zero to two pi here. And there's some here, it's hotter, there it's colder. And what the heat evolution should look like, what it looks like is that eventually these, the heat is transferred from hot to cold until uh, after a fairly long time, uh, the heat content reaches Euclid root. Well, con it becomes constant. I don't know why I cannot now state this, say this word. Um, okay, so, uh, so we, he wanted to model this behavior, uh, but so that so far is mostly physics and modeling and, uh, well, you could ask, uh, say, uh, I mean, this is somewhat unrelated. The picture is from uh, Hilbert, who studied related things in mathematics. But you could ask about what about the maths? 
Like, wh wh the, where does the math come in? And the math comes in is in the form of an equation. And uh, in physics, many things are evolved, are modeled by differential equations. It, how is the change in time dependent on the quantity? This is also how interest or finance, uh, financial models uh, are derived. But here, the quantity, is, it is changing. It's depending on two variables. Just have an H there. We have two variables, theta and T. And uh, the change in time depends on the change in the spatial direction. The heat flow depends on the derivative in X. So we have two derivatives, a t derivative and an x derivative. And these are multivariable functions. As you know, the different derivatives, they're called partial derivatives. We'll return to this point a little bit next week. Uh, but the correct form of an equation is not just a differential equation, but it's a partial differential equation, meaning that it involves partial derivatives in both t and an x derivative. Uh, in this case, a theta derivative. So if we differentiate in the second variable, the change in time can be modeled as the second derivative of the spatial derivative. So differentiating in theta, holding t fixed. Now there's usually in uh, physical cases, there is a model, the, the constant here, constant that could also depend on the location. But for us, the constant is equal to, we'll just look at the case where the constant is equal to one. You can often normalize this to be the case. And uh, it models accurately if, as far as I understand, models accurately a heat flow, say, in a metal rod, if it's a fairly uniform consistency. It's not appropriate for heat flow, say, uh, in, in something very non-homogeneous where the constant would vary. So, uh, anything like a house. I mean, you have air, walls, beds. The heat flows very non-uniformly through those different things. And uh, okay, so this is the equation that models the evolution in time of the heat content. Now, what is the initial condition? If you've taken 134, 135, then you know that these systems have an initial condition that tells you what happens at time equals zero. And at time equals zero, the heat is given by some initial distribution. So what we draw, drew here. And what we saw in the animation as the curve that became flattened out. So now, OK, you have an equation. The thing is, how do you solve it? Uh, let's forget about, there is an important issue here that I will gloss over uh, about uniqueness. Uh, you have a mathematical model, you'd hope that this has a unique solution. Fortunately, there is only one solution to this. And I can already tell you that the solutions exist basically for any boundary data F with extremely minor assumptions on F. So these equations do have solutions and they are unique. So and correspond that they correspond in practice to the solutions that you see in physical time evolution uh, cases. But you have this equation, how do you solve it? And here's a picture of uh, all of this is related to a big area of harmonic analysis. So there are several courses that are solely dedicated to this topic, and we will only touch a tiny corner of it uh, with the techniques that we have developed in this class. Uh, but how do you solve this equation? And this picture is of Jill Pfeiffer. Uh, she's a very famous mathematician uh, at Brown University. I had the privilege of meeting her once, phenomenal person. Uh, and she's done a lot of work in this area. So, so that's why her picture is honored in this talk, um, this lecture. Uh, so how do you solve an equation? And so the idea is that you don't initially solve all the equations, but you solve with some simpler equations. And it turns out that simpler equations come from trigonometric 
functions. This was an, the original observation of Fourier, at least as I understand what he, his contribution was, that you can solve this equation for very simple functions like sine and theta. Well, these are periodic functions because if you take sine n theta plus 2 pi, so this is f of theta plus 2 pi, then this is sine of n theta plus 2 pi n. And well, applying the periodicity of sine n times, you get that this is the same thing as f of n theta because you can take away the 2, n, 2 pi n without altering the value of the function. So for the, these functions, it turns out that you can solve this equation very simply, and I will show how. Uh, and the idea then after that is to express the general solution as a combination of these elementary solutions. This is a general uh, principle of linearity. If you can estimate, if you can solve a problem, if certain parts of the problem, so you can think of a certain basis of things, then the whole solution can be usually expressed as a, a sum over those uh, solutions. And one of the issues that we have to encounter here is that we will have infinitely many solutions. This is very different from, say, what you have in ODEs, where you usually have only two distinct solutions and you express the general solution as a linear combination of those two solutions. This time, we will express a general solution as an infinite sum of solutions. Um, any questions at this point? So uh, let's look at the case of the simple functions. So we wanted to solve the equation partial, partial t of h is equal to partial theta, partial theta h. Uh, and trust me, you won't need very difficult derivatives in this class. Like, so the partial derivatives are just you hold the other constants fixed. And well, how do we solve it? We know at time zero, our distribution is the sinusoidal weight, our heat distribution. And we want to solve the general time. And in ODEs, uh, a general trick that you use uh, is that you guess a solution. And you guess in, you take also another idea from there that you separate variables. Somehow you get equations in, in one dimensional variables. So let's separate variables in the following way. Let's try to find the function. Let's guess and hope that the solution of the function could actually be written as a product of two things, at times sine n theta. Now let's look at what we have here. So the equation was partial t of h is equal to partial theta, partial theta h. And let's look, compute both sides. Well, partial t of h is just we differentiate the right hand side holding theta fixed. So sine and theta is a constant. So it's a constant times at. And then the partial derivative is just the usual derivative in time. So we get a prime of t times sine and theta. Okay, this is a little bit heuristic. I haven't said that A is differentiable. Let's assume that it is and let's assume everything works out just for the purpose of derivation. If we do the derivatives in theta, well, T is fixed. So A of T is a constant, satris paribus, everything else is held constant, everything else equal. And we differentiate the second factor in theta. And what we get is well, N times cosine N theta, we differentiate it again in theta because this is a second derivative. So what we get is then uh, minus n squared sine n theta. Uh, and uh, at was a constant, so at remains up front. Okay, we insist that these are equal to each other. Well, what is the only way for these to be equal? Uh, well, if you divide away sine and theta, you have to have a prime of t is equal to a t times minus n squared. But this is an ODE. 
It's an ODE. And uh, well, an ODE needs an initial condition. So what is A of zero? Well, H theta of zero is equal to A of zero times sine and theta should be equal to sine and theta because that is what we told here. So again, if you compare the coefficients, a of zero and one, we get the equation a of zero should be equal to one. So okay, now we have a prime is equal to constant times a, a zero is equal to one. If you go back to your calculus courses, you get a solution a of t is equal to e to the minus n squared t. So we would hope that the solution then, at least with this calculation, the solution should be of the form a, a which is should be minus n squared t times sine n theta. And you can actually confirm that this is a solution. When you plug in t equals zero, this factor goes away and you're left with sine n theta. And if you do the calculation here, partial t of h, that will give you a minus n squared up front. If you compute the second theta derivatives, you'll get an n out, then again an n out, and one times a minus, so minus n squared. So indeed, this solves the equation. Okay, so we were able to solve the equation for sine and theta. And the solution became this function. Now, what about other f, uh, Fourier would ask? Uh, and, uh, well, if we know how to solve sine and theta, technically we also would have to solve cosine and theta, but we'll get to that later. But just this is just for illustrative purposes. Then, well, maybe, just maybe, you could express the initial condition h, h theta zero as a sum of sine n thetas. But as I remarked earlier, there are infinitely many things. So it's not a finite sum, not a finite linear combination of things, but an infinite linear combination of things. And if we solve each of these individually, so the solution of a n sine n theta would be a n e to the minus n squared t sine n theta. Then by linearity, you know, assume so how it played a role, uh, we'd expect that the solution actually would be a sum of these solutions. Let's check this quickly, that hand wavily. Let's check this. And um, so there are two things in this equation, the initial value condition. So for the one and two, we need to check. So let's do compute the derivatives. Okay, we compute a derivative in t of h theta t first. Well, it's a derivative of this series. And uh, we, we want to compute a derivative of the series, a n e to the minus n squared t sine n theta. Now, okay, this is a partial derivative. But a partial derivative is a normal derivative in t if theta is held fixed. And what do we know about series, being able to differentiate series? Well, we know that it is permissible as long as if we put the derivative inside, so if we differentiate on the inside, in time, so this is the derivative of this expression, d d t of that. Uh, as long as this series converges uniformly, if we know that that series converges uniformly, then we would get that this whole thing converges nicely. And then it will be differentiable. So this, this is one point where we require a justification. But let's, if we do the same thing for the theta derivatives, we would have to apply it twice. 
but by the similar argument, we should get, this time we differentiate the sine and theta, and we get minus n squared, a n e to the minus n squared t. This was not differentiated at all because it is constant once theta is changing. And what we get is two expressions that are equal to each other. They are the same series. But some things here that are worth highlighting. This part and that part. Why can we differentiate under the sum? And that when we're saying that these are equal, these things better converge. And we haven't said anything about them. But we, we now have tools from last week, uh, last two weeks, to talk a lot about when things converge, when do the derivatives converge. That's a point we will get to. Uh, and you'll be walk some of these points you will work in on week 10's homework. But what about h theta of zero? Well, if you plug in t equals zero into this expression, what do you get? Well, you get e to the n from zero to infinity, a n e to the minus n squared times zero times sine n theta. And this was the sum a n sine n theta because this factor here is one. And this we postulated to be f theta. But again, okay, we, so this would be a solution. This calculation is justified, but why can we plug in? And why does this converge? at all. Uh, and what is it? There are a number of questions in here. So all these, like this calculation is not very difficult if you permit all these steps. And this is like if you go to a physics course or an engineering course, probably this is how they treat this topic, is that they just do these calculations, uh, pray to what are, whatever deity they believe in and hope that it all works out. Uh, but this class is all about justifying those steps. So how do we justify these steps? We have to talk about convergence, uh, as we said a couple of times. And here, a very appropriate picture is of Terence Tao, uh, who you probably all have heard of, a uh, professor here at UCLA. Uh, and he works in also in harmonic analysis, probably the most famous harmonic analysis in the world right now. And uh, he, he has done a lot of work on exactly this kind of issues about convergence of Fourier series and there are various applications and he has a very broad repertoire. And he's actually right now teaching a course on uh, convergence of Fourier series. I mean, one aspect is convergence of Fourier series. So if you are interested, you can probably find his lectures on his blog or notes elsewhere, but uh, anyways, some basic classical questions about the series uh, that we were interested in. So we're looking at f of theta being equal to n equals one to infinity or from zero to infinity, a n sine n theta in some sense. And there is, when does this converge? I mean, under what assumption of a n? When is it equal to f? I mean, you could have this series converge, but does it have to equal f? Well, not for any a n. And well, there should be a single choice of a n to make it converge. And what is that a n? How do you find those a n? So how do you find the a n? How do you how do you find the a n? How do you prove convergence? And how do you show that it's equal to f? These are the three things that somehow we have to touch upon. Uh, and we'll, in the coming days and the homework, we will justify these in a very specific case. 
And the specific case I briefly mentioned earlier is when f is twice continuously differentiable and 2 pi periodic. So it has two derivatives in the 131a sense. This is a function of a single real variable. And uh, we'll express f as a series, some of these series. Any questions? Uh, so before we start talking about complex numbers, uh, I want to do another short demonstration just to see what we are actually again talking about. Uh, so stolen from another website. Oh, this is still running in the background. Um, okay. So this is a, not a very good uh, interface, but I didn't want to spend time coding this. Uh, so it's showing here I can control the number of bar uh, coefficients of Fourier series that I can take in. Uh, and uh, there was a small thing about the cosines that we'll get to later, but uh, here you have this kind of a so-called heaviside type function. Uh, it's equal to one uh, until, from minus one to one to zero. So it's not a function from zero to two pi, but it's almost the same. And then from zero to one, uh, it's equal to minus one. And this would be the first three terms of the Fourier series. So it gives you this kind of an oscillating thing. If you add more terms, let's say multiply the coefficients by two. Oops. Um, do that. Um, oh, wait, yeah, sorry. I co calculate eight coefficients. Uh, it's going to, yeah, it's going to do six for some reason. Uh, okay. So as you add more coefficients, you get a function that more closely approximates. This is a discontinuous function, which we will not, not talk about a lot. So there's some weird behavior that happens close to this jump. There's a very quick transition that has to happen here. And actually close to this transition, you have these humps that never really quite go away, no matter the degree that you have. This is curious, that's called the Gibbs phenomenon, but we will not talk about that. So there are many interesting things here actually you can look at, but if you take 20 coefficients, then you get something very close. Again, very close to this jump, and this is why we exclude jumps because they're difficult to analyze, there's something weird happening. So there's this little hump here that goes up to 1.1, and even if you do like 200 terms, you'll still see a little hump if this would allow me to do the calculation. Yeah, well, it doesn't quite show the hump there, but there's a little, a little bump towards the end there. I think their numerical accuracy is probably going away. But uh, you can do this also for other functions. So more like a linear function, they're doing a piecewise thing here. So that's why I have to put it in two different places. And let's just look at five coefficients first. You get something like this. Again, this should be thought of as two pi periodic. So there is a jump here from minus one to one. This other side, if you wrap this around in the sense that we're doing, if you cross around here, the function jumps from one to minus one. So it's not really continuous, but in the parts where it's continuous, you see this behavior that we expect that these coefficients, when appropriately chosen, converge to the function. These are some classical pictures that you get. Again, close to this jump, close to this endpoint, there's some weirdness happening that we can't conclude. Uh, yeah. Okay. Let's go back to our notes. So we saw a little bit, we're looking for these representations of these functions and these uh, simple calculations uh, or simulations uh, seemingly suggest that you can really express any function as a sum of sines, uh, sines and cosines. Uh, this is somewhat remarkable because many functions do not look at all like sine or cosine. And uh, at this point, maybe it's worth highlighting this connection to Weierstrass theorem that 
trigonometric polynomials are dense in the space of polynomials, meaning that any, any function, any, any function can be approximated by trigonometric polynomials. That's, we stated such a theorem uh, a couple of weeks back. 